Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. Today, we're gonna to take a look at this server right here, which is the Tyan Transport SX TS65B8253. And that is a very long model number, but this is a dual AMD Epic 7002, which is the Rome series and future 7003, which will be Milan next year server. It has PCIe Gen 4 support, and it's a 2U server that's really designed for the storage market. Now, when we get to the hardware overview, I'm going to show you why this is actually a really interesting system for me, because it's on one hand a three and a half inch drive system, but there's also a absolute ton of PCIe Gen 4 connectivity. And some of the things that Tyen did in this system were both designed to save costs, but also provide a lot of flexibility. So we're going to go over those things. Now, we're going to have timestamps in the description of this video, but basically the game plan is laid out right in front of me. First, we're going to do a hardware overview. We're going to get start on literally the front of the server. We're going to work our way back to the rear of the server. We're just going to talk about some of the different parts and what's interesting about each section. We'll also go a little bit into the management, power consumption, and performance. At the end, of course, timestamps in the description. By the way, before we get too far, I did want to point out the fact that this is the Tyen Transport SX TS65 B8253, but that's not the full bare bones model number. Technically, this one is actually the, let me get this right, B8253T65V10E4HR-2T. That 2T means that we have 10 gig Ethernet. We're going to get to that in a little bit, but you just have to remember that the way that tie-in names their systems is more along the engineering lines. And so they tie more closely in terms of bomb to an actual bare bones like this. And so the reason that we have a super specific model number like that typically in the industry means that we have a company that's using kind of those specific model numbers rather than using a marketing name and then having different bomb options. Just a different way to do it. And this is just shows that Tyne is a little bit more engineering focused than some other organizations. But hey, dual AMD Epic CPUs, up to four terabytes in memory capacity and tons of PCIe expansion. Let's get looking at the hardware overview. Now, looking at the front of the system, we have things like two USB ports and they're type A ports, which is actually kind of interesting. We have our LED status lights, power buttons, identification, but all that kind of stuff that you'd expect on the front of a system. And then most of the system though is taken up by the three and a half inch base. Now there are a total of 12 three and a half inch bays on the front of the chassis. And what Tyen does with these bays up front is something that's really interesting. There's actually a removable drive plane back plane right here. And that gives Tyen the ability to use different storage configurations. And there's just these little blue thumb screws to be able to take the back plane on and off, which is actually really serviceable. And it's really nice because it makes it easy to customize or serve later. But what we have in this particular solution is that we have 12 three and a half inch bays, and each of those bays can take a you know traditional hard drive and a SATA hard drive. This system is set up to be able to actually service those 12 SATA bays if you want to without using a SAS HBA or RAID controller or anything like that. You can just run it right off the AMD CPUs. That may not seem like a big deal, but it saves a couple hundred dollars versus going and getting an HBA. So in some storage configurations, that's what people want is extreme cost optimization on that type of data path. And this is a good example of how Tyne is providing that. The other really big feature on these front panel drives is that four of the drive bays can actually be NVMe SSD drive bays as well. So there's wiring on this back plane and there's wiring through the chassis to take PCIe lanes and bring those to the front of the system. We were able to get Kyokushia CD6 drives as well as some Samsung 1733 drives to link up a PCIe Gen 4 speeds up front. So that's actually a really cool capability because that means you get an absolute ton of performance out of those four drive bays. And even using those as NVMe drive bays, you still get eight three and a half drives for if you want to like hard drives or something like that, you still can do that in this chassis. Now building all of that flexibility in means that we have a lot of wires that are going to the back because we have both the NVMe as well as the SATA data paths that have to happen as well as power. And hey, as we're going through this server hardware overview, what I really like is for you to take a look and say, hey, these are things that I like in this server. These are things maybe I don't even like. Maybe this is a reason that this server isn't perfect for me or is perfect for me. And if you see things that maybe we're not covering that you want us to cover a little bit more, put those in the comments. I'm gonna check them out and see what you guys put down there because I just like to hear your opinions as well and you know what we can do better on future videos. But let's keep moving on. For the back, we have the fan partition. Now there are only three chassis fans in this entire system, which is actually not a lot. Sometimes we see these types of systems with four or five fans. And so having only three fans here is actually not much. 
Something else that's a little bit different about these fan holders is that they're all metal designs, which is actually a lot different from what we see in the industry. We typically see that these fan holders are plastic units. And so seeing something that's metal is actually just different. These fans still have hot swap power connectors. So they have wiring so you can just pull them out and plop the new ones back in. You do have to do a little bit more alignment on this than you do some of the plastic and like heavy plastic units. But I actually kind of like the metal here. Having only three fans does mean that cooling is a little bit limited, but not really that much. We're going to talk about that in a second. The next part of the system that I want to talk about is right here, and this is the power distribution board. Now, we take the two redundant power supplies and then they feed into this portion of the board, and that is what gives you the ability to have like two power supplies and then have one set of outputs that go to all the major systems. A lot of the AMD Epic boards that we see utilize power supplies that connect directly into the motherboard instead of having a separate power distribution board. So this is a little bit different. And one of the reasons that this is designed with this distribution center is because we are actually using a more standard EATX style motherboard in this system rather than a proprietary motherboard. And in front of the power distribution, there's actually probably the biggest feature in this entire system, and that's these two AMD Epic CPU sockets. Now these two SP3 sockets can take AMD Epic 7000 to Rome series CPUs. We expect that they're going to be upgraded soon to the Epic 7003 series. Now the system can handle up to 240 watt TDP CPUs, which means that you basically get almost the entire range of AMD Epic 7002 series processors, including 64 core parts in this system. For a lot of storage applications, frankly, you're never going to use those 64 core parts. You're going to look a lot kind of at the lower end, 16 core, 12 core, maybe even up to the mid 32 cores or something like that. But really, you're not going to use the 64 core processors in this type of system in most storage applications, just because storage, frankly, doesn't need that much CPU power. Of course, if you're buying a tie-in system like this and you want to do something exciting, you can totally do that because you can go up to 240 watt. Now, each of these two CPU sockets has eight DDR4 3200 DIMM slots, which means that we have a total of 16 DIMM slots in the system. And that in AMD Epic terms means that we can go technically up to four terabytes of memory in this system. And putting that into perspective for a second, if we look at the Intel Xeon Cascade Lake refresh, the second generation Xeon scalable refresh parts that came out earlier in 2020, what we see is that those CPUs can only handle up to one terabyte of memory each. Now, Intel does have some higher end SKUs that can go up to, you know, higher memory capacities for a lot more. But if you want to kind of get over one terabyte, this is actually a lot cheaper to do that. And while that is a kind of cool headline spec, frankly, you're going to have to use very large DIMMs to be able to do four terabytes in only 16 DIMM slots. And so as a result, you're probably not going to use that density, but it is there. You also get eight channel memory with the AMD Epic series, which is actually a big deal for storage. There's a lot of stuff that gets cached and having memory is a awesome capability and especially a lot of memory slots and memory bandwidth. There is one thing that we should mention, and that is some of the lower end SKUs that AMD sells are actually four channel memory optimized, which means that you can get eight channels of memory. So you can technically put eight DIMMs in each socket, but you only get really the memory bandwidth of around four of those channels worth even though you may have eight channels of memory installed. I'm only mentioning that here because I think those CPUs are going to be very popular, something like the 7282 or something like that. That's a you know relatively higher core count, but very low cost, low power SKU is going to be a important CPU in the storage arena. Now, as we move back, what we're going to get to is the power supplies. Now we get dual redundant 1200 watt power supplies in the system. Frankly, for a system like this, that's going to be absolutely plenty. But you can actually add a lot of expansion in this system. And that's what I want to talk about next. So we're going to start at the edge that's kind of closest to you. And that's really this kind of leading edge up here where we actually have two SATA DOM slots. We also have some of the other SATA connectivity for the motherboard and that brings SATA connectivity to the front of the chassis. Now, I mentioned earlier that one of the most interesting aspects to this entire system is the expandability and expansion options that you get in this system. First off, what we get is we get a series of vertically mounted low profile slots and there's a total of four slots. Three of those slots are PCIe Gen 4 by 16 slots and they're low profile, but they're vertically mounted and they're right there on the motherboard itself. There's also an additional slot, which is a PCIe Gen 4 by 8 slot. So you get a total of four vertically mounted slots to go add all kinds of expansion. You could add SSDs, you could add external drive shelf connectivity or whatever you want. You have a ton of bandwidth there. And then there's a specialized connector on the motherboard and that specialized connector connects to this thing right here, which is the PCIe riser. 
And this piece right here actually has two different purposes. The first purpose is that when it sits in between these CPUs, it kind of goes like right about here. What it does is it actually directs airflow. So you can see how this is a smooth metal portion. This actually directs the airflow through the chassis. So that way it kind of helps channel airflow to the different CPUs and expansion slots. So that's kind of the first purpose of this. But the second part is really on this side over here, where you have three PCIe Gen 4 expansion slots. Now there's a by 16 slot, as well as two PCIe Gen 4 by 8 slots. All told, between these three and the four that are on the motherboard, you get a total of seven expansion slots, and three of them are actually full height expansion slots. And why that matters, at least to me, is just the fact that you have the front panel con connectivity where you have, you know, NVMe, four NVMe SSDs up front. You also have the ability to have up to 12 or with the four NVMe SSDs, really eight hard drives up here and SATA without even having to use a controller. So all of these seven expansion slots, you can actually use for devices. And with those seven slots, you have a ton of flexibility. I mean, you can have, you know, 100 gig or 200 gig Ethernet on those slots. You can have things like, NVIDIA T4s or AMD GPUs. So you can put GPUs in this or FPGAs and accelerators, those types of things in the system. I and mean, there are a whole bunch of different options that you get when you just have that much PCIe connectivity and you have the ability to run both full height as well as low profile all on the same chassis. To me, I think that's a really awesome capability. We have three other things that I want to point out on this motherboard specifically. The first is that we have a micro SD card slot. We also have the Intel X550 10 gig ethernet controller, which is under the heatsink here. And then we, one thing we don't have is we don't actually have M.2 storage. Now, of course we have all these low profile and full height slots. So it's pretty easy to actually add M.2 storage on a card. It's very inexpensive to go do that. And I think that is the way that Tyne is looking at you to customize a system like this is by using a device that can provide M.2 storage on a PCIe instead of having that on the motherboard itself. Most motherboards these days have the ability to run an M.2 SSD, at least one on the motherboard itself because M.2 storage has become so popular as boot options, what have you. Now you do have the SATA DOM slots, but it's still just something that's a little bit different. And the lack of M.2 storage for boot or something like that is, well, I guess something that you might expect in a system like this because of this feature right here. Now this is a dual two and a half inch drive bay rear accessible solution. And so I think the idea here is that you have two SATA bays and you can put boot devices like say two boot SATA SSDs into this section right here. And then you have the ability to hot swap them. And that's something that you don't have with M.2 SSDs. So that actually makes this a little bit more serviceable than if we did have M.2 SSDs on the board itself. There's also conspicuously a slim SAS connector right here on the back of this PCB backplane for these two and a half inch drives. And my guess is that you can actually wire up or find a way to wire up NVMe SSDs into these rear drive bays. So if you really want an NVMe boot option, that's a great way to go do it. The other thing that would allow you to do, of course, is the ability to run 12 drive bays up here, which are your three and a half inch hard drives, and then still have two cache drives with NVMe back here. So technically what you can do is you can put four NVMe SSDs in here as well as have 10 SATA drives, but there's eight three and a half inch and two two and a half inch SATA drives. On the back of the system, we get legacy ports like a VGA port, a serial port. We get two USB 3.0 ports, an out-of-band management port, and then we get four network ports. Now two of those network ports are one gig ethernet Intel ports, and then two of them are the Intel X550 10 gig or 10 G base T network ports. And so you get a lot of actually connectivity on the system itself. I know some of our readers are gonna say, hey, for a storage server, maybe I wanna have 25 gig ethernet. And so why don't we have a QSFP 28 connector on here. And if you actually look at the motherboard, there isn't really enough room to have a full SFP28 cage on that area without moving other components. So I think that's probably why we see 10 G base T on here rather than 25 gig ethernet. Now, in terms of management, we're not going to go too much into that because we actually have an entire video just looking at the tie-in web management, but they're using the Megrack SPX solution, which means that you get things like an HTML5 IKVM, you get the ability to have Redfish, you have a whole bunch of different features that go into a system like this and being able to manage it at a band. One of the cool things that the tie-in does is that number one, they don't charge you for that IKVM functionality. So you can get it without having to pay an upgrade like you would do with something like a HP ILO or a Dell iDRAC or an X-Clarity controller from Lenovo. You don't have to pay that extra fee in a system like this. The other thing the tie-in lets you do is to upgrade the BIOS directly from the web interface. And so you don't need an 
extra you know, $20 license, I think is what Supermicro charges for their solution like that. And so you get all that built in here, which is just, you know, a couple, you know, it's not a huge dollar amount, but it is something that's nice with the tie-in system versus some of the other systems in the market. Now, in terms of performance, we got exactly what we would expect. I mean, we're pretty late now in the AMD Epic 7002 Rome product lifecycle. So we pretty much know how these CPUs are going to perform. We also know how the PCIe Gen 4 SSDs are going to perform as well as hard drives. So there's really not a lot of surprises here in terms of performance, but it is something that we just wanted to talk about real quick. In terms of power consumption, this thing can vary a wild amount. I mean, you have 1200 watt redundant power supplies, which are absolutely great. And they're usually plenty for a system like this. Now we had configurations in the system running at over 800 watts and we had high-end CPUs in here, hard drives. We had a whole bunch of expansion cards in here. We actually got the system up to, you know, well over 800 watts. Now, on the other hand, when we use some lower power processors, we didn't have necessarily as much, you know, high performance storage networking and all that kind of gear in here. We actually had the system running at about 350 watts pretty normally, which is pretty darn good for a system like this. Now we do have the full system review on the STA main site. So you can definitely go check that out and get more into some of the details. We have the block diagrams and stuff like that up there. So if you want to go see a little bit more detail, you can go check out the STH main site where we write a lot more on these servers. But we are trying to do a little bit more YouTube content. So I wanted to show what the system looks like and some of the features of it. I also wanted to get some feedback and just kind of hear what you guys think of a server like this. I don't necessarily think that this is the server for everyone, but at the same time, it's relatively short depth and it's designed to be more cost optimized, which I think a lot of people in the storage industry, especially that are looking at this specific 2U 12 bay form factor are going to really like. And hey, if you made it this far, why don't you click on subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. We have a ton more coming both in 2020, but then also when we get to 2021 and we start seeing a lot of the platforms refresh, we're going to have a ton of coverage on both the CPUs and servers that are going to be involved in that. And so check out the STH main site and check back here. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.